welcome to The Watcher. I'm your colleague, Tom Bot, and I just watched episode 5, the penultimate episode of Moon Knight. And... Holy shit. Uh, yeah, this is the... This is the episode. Let's be honest. This is... When we talk about this show, this is the one we're all gonna remember. This was a defining episode of the show, if not the defining one. I can't imagine the finale is going to top it. It was the best episode of Moon Knight. Probably. Possibly the best episode of Marvel television to date, in my opinion at least. And there certainly are some contenders, but it, was, it is up there. This was the episode I think a lot of us were waiting for, because we get a bit more backstory, we get the origin, and it's something we kind of wondered about in the last few weeks, which is that they didn't really give Moon Knight his origin. Uh, and they kind of did it here in a way that we found out Stephen Grant's origin and Mark's origin. And they did it in a way that was very interesting. This was amazing. This was a fantastic episode. But let's dive into it a bit more um, because there's there's quite a bit to dive into. So, of course, at the end of last episode, we had the kind of brain-breaking uh, ending where Mark was shot in a tomb and then he wakes up in an asylum uh, questioning whether all this was real. And we get the answer that essentially it is real. He What happened is he's dead and he's in the duat, or the afterlife, or whatever. Uh, let's go into this a little bit. There's a few interesting things. He, we have uh, him talking to the therapist, Harrow, uh, who's still named Harrow, thankfully. So that's not too confusing. I don't have to remember two names. And he's saying that basically his mind is swinging from sense to nonsense. All these kind of delusions of, you know, fighting tombs and being a superhero, all this sort of stuff. He's saying that's not real. Um, he, he sees um, Tarot, of course, they're saying this is nonsense. You're seeing a giant hippo, duh. Um, and as he's saying this, we get something very interesting. I've seen a few people pick up on it, but I think it's an epi it's something that could go either way. So, obviously, we're, we're dealing with Steven, we're dealing with Mark. Mark is the person who we are seeing in the asylum scenes, um, whenever Harrow and the therapist are involved. But there is a brief moment where he's very distressed and angry. And it looks like he picks up something to possibly stab himself when Harrow starts to question him. And he doesn't sound exactly like Mark. Now, some people are saying, oh yeah, well, he's just very worked up. That's why he sounds different. To me, it sounds like a totally different accent. His mannerisms appear different. I think this was Jake Lockley. This could very well be the first appearance of Jake Lockley. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a reach. I'm not sure, but it kind of felt like it was a very noticeable. Like... I feel like if you're going to do that, and it's not an intentional, you know, hint towards Jake Lockley or a third persona, you would get him to refilm the scene, because it was very different <laughs> to how he is in the rest of the show. But he's sedated as a result of that, and once he's sedated, it's now him and Steven back in front of Tarette. Ta Tawaret? Ta fuck it. <laughs> um, Tarette informs him that they're dead, okay? Uh, it's, she says... Uh, interestingly, it's been a minute since we've had a soul in here, so seemingly the Egyptian afterlife is kind of, I guess from lack of belief, maybe. Uh, it's not a thing anymore, so she's not used to it. And basically she explains why it is that we're in asylum. She says, this is the Egyptian afterlife, uh, which excites Stephen. Not, Mark, not so much. <laughs> I also love the kind of explanation, the, the kind of easy sidestep here. It's a very obvious answer, because of course we're dealing with, you know, gods all over the place in the MCU and all sorts of entities and the cosmos and it, very clearly they're just like it's an afterlife not the afterlife there we go there's multiple afterlife possibly uh we also get a mention to the ancestral plane which is uh, a very clear reference to black panther uh which is of course where uh we see all the different um black panthers and kings of wakanda uh kind of in their afterlife and it's interesting because we don't get many mc references but this was the most overt one uh, to date possibly um the, but they basically say that the duat is uh, incomprehensible to the human mind. The, the afterlife is not comprehensible. So because of that, you pick something that you're familiar with. So the big question is, why is it an asylum? Yeah, that, it, I mean, it was an answer straight away. I don't, I don't know why I put suspense in that. Because Mark just says, yeah, because we're insane. <laughs> and of course, it, like the idea, like, yeah, talking hippo, dead bird. Yeah, pretty obviously you're insane. Uh, but what's not that insane is that or this certainly proves they're maybe not insane, is that why one door they go and uh, suddenly they're not in an asylum anymore. They're on the deck of a ship that is sailing through the sands of the afterlife. L awesome visual. 
uh, it's sometimes the the scale of this show is probably a bit smaller in some respects. This was really cool. This felt epic to seeing them on the boat that was going through the kind of purplish sands of an afterlife. It was very visually interesting and cool. I mean, it was just a really uh, interesting moment to have and a great visual uh, as we come into the, the end of the show. So as they're doing this, basically, they're being guided to the afterlife. Uh, they see the kind of people who were, were not worthy in the sands uh, below. Of course, we talked a lot about, I mean, we're all learning a lot about the Egyptian afterlife process through Moon Knight, which is that the heart is weighed against a feather of mat. Hey, I remembered it. Oh, I couldn't remember that God's name for ages. Damn. <laughs> I'm sure in the first two episodes I got God's name like in, in there somewhere. I couldn't find it, but here we go. I remember it this time. And the idea is that the scale has to be balanced. This is, of course, Harrow's big thing. He's, uh, you know, working uh, for the God. Uh, Oh, oh for fuck's sake! I remember one guy's name and not the other. God damn it! <laughs> so yeah, he's uh, they're they're balancing the scales, um, and essentially, what he has here is they take the two hearts, the one of America, one of Stephen, and they put them on the scales to see if they balance. And naturally, obviously, they don't. So, the question then is, why aren't they balanced? And we we had hinted that. He was not balanced before. When Harrow checked it for, he said, there's kind of chaos inside you. Uh, Amit, there's the god. There we go. Hey, I remember two gods this week, eventually. Uh, no big deal, Tom. <laughs> it's not like you should have this in front of you and remember it's right now. So basically, they put his two hearts up there. They're unbalanced. And they say, like, if you want any chance of getting into the afterlife, this has to balance. They say, your hearts are not complete. Uh, and whatever you're hiding, you need to show each other the truth or you will not reach the afterlife. And because of this, they explore each other's memories. Uh, firstly, you gotta love Mark, who's like, I'm gonna, why don't we just fight Tyrett? Um, yeah, of course, just, just fight the giant hippo god. That would have been an interesting fight scene. Uh, so we go through, they kind of go through the corridors of the asylum, and inside these doors are memories. So one memory, neither seem to remember. It seems to be a man, looks like a man waiting for a car, or certainly waiting near a car. We will come back to it. They hear uh, a boy screaming then, which kind of takes them out of it, and they run to the scream, and they burst into a cafe full of dead bodies with a, a scale unsettled in the middle of them. And of course, as you might imagine, these are the people that Mark killed for Conchu. Which, holy shit, uh, he's got some red in his ledger, <laughs> to use the MCU parlance. I like that they're not, like, I really like that they're not showing away for Mark really not being a good guy. He's done really bad things. This is a, like, there's a lot of people in this cafe. Um, of There's men, there's women. The most startling thing, of course, is the child that is not dead, but is screaming and running around. So, uh, basically, we have, first of all, we have a tender moment where Mark kind of admits he wished that he had failed multiple times and that these people would have killed him. Uh, and doing that makes the scales a bit more balanced. So again, we're seeing that, yeah, the more you reveal to each other, the more likely it is that you could get into the afterlife but as that child uh is now in the room the child runs off and stephen begins to chase him mark though uh as they chase him the child goes through a door another memory stephen gets through the door but mark is locked on the outside this is what makes up the bulk of the episode which is the backstory for mark and the origin for stephen as well it is Amazing. It's dark. <laughs> I don't want to pra praise it too much. I'm like, this is really great, really fun. Because it's not. It's pretty depressing. Probably the darkest thing in the MCU uh, come to memory. Uh, I don't know. Except for maybe, you know, the, there's probably a few minor things that if you really think about it, are really dark. But this was, this was laying it on Front Street and it was pretty fucking dark. So Stephen sees his mother and two boys. One being Mark and one his little brother Randall. Now, Randall is an interesting character for a few reasons. Uh, Randall is a character in the comics. He becomes, uh, or he, I think he believes himself to be the avatar of Khonshu uh, and becomes Shadow Knight. Uh, I believe, and I guess this is appropriate for what we're going to discuss in a minute, Mark eventually kills Randall. I believe it was, was it during Shadow, Shadowland for Daredevil, maybe? Uh, interesting, though. I do wonder, you know, we're getting all this talk of Jake Lockley and how all the personas have their own costume. Uh, or superhero alter ego. I wonder if Jay Glock could maybe take up the Shadow Knight persona for his brother, uh, who is going to be dead. Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, again, interesting that they, they took that right from the comics, but uh, 
it doesn't a lot of this stuff I should say is directly from the comics it's Jeff Lemire's run there's a lot of references even in like the set design yeah, is rife with elements from the comics which man they really should be paying these people when it's like literally like yeah what did you have on the walls in your comic oh I'll put that up here <laughs> like come on you're definitely saving a bit of money by just copying their work give them a little bit of cash at least but speaking of artists Randall is drawing a goldfish that's right it's Gus the one finned goldfish that's uh, cool. That kind of explains that, uh, which is cool because we like we never really got an explanation for that in the first episode. It was like, why is he one fin? Why is he two fin? I didn't know when we would get an explanation for it, but it's cool that we did. We also should say this also ties in very well to what we saw at the end of the last week's episode where they were watching a film called Tomb Busters, because this is very pivotal to this whole origin story, the kind of Indiana Jones riff, Tomb Busters. So Mark and his brother go out together exploring a cave like that film. We also get a very unfortunate use of the phrase, Laters, gators, as his mom says. <laughs> yeah, like the god Amit. Gators are everywhere here. Uh, so they're role-playing the film. Uh, one of them is Stephen Grant, and the other is his sidekick. I think it was Roland or something along those lines. We began with an R, I think. Uh, it starts to rain, though. And Randall reminds Mark that Mom said we shouldn't play in the cave when it's raining, but he insists that it'll be fine. Oh, this, the word, what I really... What was really unsettling and sad about this was that, you know, we get a lot of origins in in uh, Marvel when there is sort of trauma and sadness when someone dies. And a lot of time it's kind of, you know, some cr there's a criminal element or there's a supernatural element. You know, someone can get killed by a gun or conflict or war and all this. But this was such a domestic, um, real world situation that it was really upsetting. And that's why this episode worked to be so devastating as it was. So Stephen um, kind of runs to the mouth of the cave and sees the water dripping in and realizes the water is rising. And he's screaming and shouting at the boys to get out. But of course, they can't hear him. But he can hear them screaming really dark. And yeah, Mark seems very upset by this. And he kind of wanders the halls of the asylum. But he enters a door in a room because of course he was locked out of that memory. And one of the rooms he enters, there's people dressed in black um, mourning. Uh, the death of Randall because Randall of course drowned in that cave and uh, Stephen is now also in the memory and a young Mark peers from the stairs and his mother sees him and lashes out at him saying you were meant to keep him safe and that it's your fault he's dead Whew, again uncomfortably real and really depressing um, and then it, what's a, it's a cool kind of visual idea Mark um keeps or sorry Stephen because of course Stephen is trying to uncover this because as we learn Stephen is sort of the the pure side of the characters uh, or pure persona that Mark created but he's running up the stairs and each time he runs upstairs he gets a new memory and Mark is trying to stop him the whole way up but he goes upstairs and we see a birthday uh, his mother or sorry we see one birthday first uh, and it's the younger Mark celebrating his birthday his father is there from his mother can't even face him he runs upstairs again. That's another birthday. This time his mother is there, but she's incredibly inebriated. Uh, and she says, like, I should have known you'd do something like this because you were always jealous of Randall. Ooh, man, it's so, so upsetting. <laughs> um, so he continues to run up the stairs, discovering new memories. And interestingly, we get a, what's going to be an especially traumatic one um, because we see that Mark has run into the, his bedroom, the young Mark that is, and the door is locked, he locked, closed the door behind him, Stephen's about to go in, and Mark kind of drags him out, and says that, you know, um, don't, basically don't go in there, you don't need to see this, um, Stephen is very upset though, that Mark is remembering the mother like that, because his memory of the mother, is nothing like that, it's very positive, and that she was a very loving mother, and again we see a reason for that later on, we then get another memory, where Mark is leaving home, he's now grown up, uh, the relationship between him and his mother is, is seemingly totally fractured at this point. We've skipped quite a bit ahead. And his father tells him not to go. He can't lose another son. <sighs> and I, I can't remember was I crying at this point, but I'm pretty sure by the end I was like, oh God, let me just sit down for a while. This is why this episode is late, because I was like, this is, I don't want to dig into this. This is really sad. <laughs> but yeah, as that happens, Mark drags him away and suddenly they are in a desert, surrounded by bodies. And flaming wreckage this is how we get the origin of moon knight which man i was never critical of us not getting uh his origin story not really anyway because 
I got it. They explained it enough. I get it. But I feel like the way they did it here was perfect because it's exactly what it needed to be. We got, you know, glimpses of what happened. Even though we'd already heard it, they didn't spend long at it. But it was enough that we could feel the kind of drama to it because now we knew who the person that was laying there dead was. We saw him making a connection with Conchu, which again was something that we'd heard of multiple times. We didn't necessarily need to see it, but I think the way they did it was very well handled and very good. So as they go through this wreckage, uh, they're of course surrounded by bodies. Stephen remembers that Harrow said he was a mercenary and killed hostages. And Mark says he was left with very few options after he went AWOL in a fugue state and was discharged from the military. Again, they make Mark out to be such an interesting and compelling character because he's not a good guy, but he's also a sympathetic anti-hero at times because he had a traumatic upbringing and because he was left with no real options because of his mental condition. So it is quite sad. He's kind of a tragic hero in a way, which is kind of what you want from the darker side of the MCU, really. But... We have uh, then a mention, I've talked with his character every week, and finally, the show has mentioned him this week, Bushman, which we said is one of the great uh, villains for Moon Knight, probably his greatest uh, villain. And he basically just says in passing, he went to work for his old commanding officer, Bushman. But when he gets there, the job was already an Egyptian tomb. Bushman changed the plan and wanted no witnesses. Mark insists he tried to get, away, get them away. We see, of course, that he failed. When we see Layla's dad dead, uh, on the floor, along with others, he's got the scarf to make him recognisable. Uh, nearby, though, we see uh, a fatally wounded Mark is dragging himself into a tomb. Or into a... Maybe not a tomb, but a, a temple, maybe, is a better word. Uh, and, and he drags himself to the steps of the god Conchu, and as he's about to end his life, he's literally about to off himself, he hears Conchu's voice. So he says he needs an avatar to carry out his deeds and live. Mark is unsure, though, if he wants to live or die. He feels that his mind is fractured and broken, though Conchu is like, your mind is fractured and broken. Which, again, we talked before about how in the comics sometimes it's that Conchu broke his mind, or he picked him because his mind was broken. Uh, here, it kind of feels like it just happened that his mind was broken, and Conchu took it anyway. But he does tell Mark, you know, very clearly, uh, you must swear to protect travellers at night and bring Conchu's vengeance on those who bring them harm. And then we see Mark rising, a, a very kind of dramatic rise, almost like a rise from the dead, quite suitably, um, as Moon Knight for the first time. The scales now uh, begin to balance a bit uh, a bit on the boat, and we see that the souls uh, uh, are being cast down to the afterlife before their time. So this is what Harrow was doing. He's judging people before their time, and we're seeing them cast into the sands of the afterlife of the duet. And yeah, uh, Tarette, in case you weren't aware, she's like, that's not good. <laughs> so yeah, Harrow's not the good guy, in case you weren't sure by now. Uh, she realises that the only way to stop this though is to bring back Conchu and let Mark and Stephen be his avatar but their scales must be balanced for that to work so we're not done the trauma yet hooray Stephen assumes that what happened in the bedroom was the final piece and Mark pleads not to put him through it again we get a very again a moment why this character is so sympathetic he really has almost a meltdown a breakdown where he's like I'll tell you everything but just don't put me through that again it's really heartbreaking and dude we see this here and later on. And I know there's stigma sometimes with Marvel shows. Oscar Isaac deserves a fucking nomination, dude. He was so good in this. Like, in this episode especially, the emotional heavy lifting he had to do was fantastic. I mean, he's been great in the whole series, but here it's like, submit this for the Emmys, the Golden Globes, whatever you need to do. He should definitely get some consideration because he was fantastic in this episode. But... Mark basically just has a breakdown uh, and instead of us going into his memory, he flashes back to being in Harrow's office and he insists that sedation didn't happen. He's like, look, I, I, I didn't sedate you, you're imagining it. And he tells Mark that he's proud of him and that reliving these painful memories isn't easy. So again, it's, it's casting that doubt that maybe all the stuff he's imagining there, that could be fake. Uh, he also asks Mark, does he think he invented Stephen to hide from the awful things he did? Or did Stephen create Mark to punish everyone for what his mother did to him? Holy fuck. That is raw. That is damn, man. That was like the coldest line to ever drop on someone. It's like, hey, did you invent this guy <laughs> because you wanted to get away from awful things? Or did you just create the other guy so you could be awful because your shit was bad? It's like, damn, that's... 
Ooh, that was a rough, that was a rough line. That was a, that therapist got real with him. Um, and he tells him basically you need to open up to Stephen as well. And in his room, we see a young Mark being watched by Mark and Stephen. We're now back in his memories. After that hour line, I guess they were like, I can't continue. <laughs> and yeah, Stephen recognizes the room, but he doesn't recognize the memory. Mark's mom is beating down the door, like absolutely laying into it. And Mark is insisting that that is not his mom. And then he flashes into being Stephen. We hear a British accent. And it's, yeah, it's the creation of Stephen Grant, who, of course, is on the poster for Tomb, Ra Tomb Busters, which is hanging up in the room. There's a lot of Easter eggs on that as well. There's Easter eggs to the original creators of Moon Knight on the poster. There's a reference to Timely and Atlas comics, uh, who predated Marvel. Uh, and then, again, we have a, a cool uh, line here on the poster. The tagline of the film is, When danger is near, Stephen Grant has no fear. So, again, showing the why the, the thread of that character would be in, in Mark somewhere. Again, it was also a very important movie to him and his brother. And I think there's even a moment where we see them playing with action figures of that. So yeah, there's a lot of references to Tomb Busters and why that was so pivotal to his creation of Steven. Realizing now that Mark created Steven and that he is not real, just as his mother breaks uh, the door down and takes a leather belt and starts to beat him, uh, we kind of cut out of that scene. We don't see too much of her of her laying into Mark or, or Mark Stephen uh, with a belt. Thankfully, we hear it, but uh, we get out of there before it gets really bad. Stephen doesn't see uh, as Mark. Uh, sorry, he doesn't. Uh, Mark says the whole point of Stephen is that he doesn't see that stuff. That's why he takes Stephen out of there. He's like, you're created because you had a normal happy life. And again, there's something very tragic about this. Stephen and Mark have this conversation. He says like, you had a normal happy life, but it was a lie. Whereas you had a sad, depressing life, but it was real. You know, it's like, damn, that's real philosophy to that. You know, like, you could have a life that's not real, but perfect. Uh, but, or you can have real life with suffering and trauma. It really is that, uh, you know, getting in the, the tank and having a perfect life, even if it's fake. It's very kind of a, a matrixy, daycarty kind of a philosophy thought experiment. But as that's happening, basically... Um, Stephen says, like, you know, I've, I've gone through my existence thinking my mother was kind, that he loved her, and that she was still alive. And as soon as Stephen hears that, he's like, oh, still alive. Mark's like, hey, you had, you had the perfect life. You thought your mother was lovely, she was kind, she loved you, and that she was alive. And Stephen's like, what, what do you mean? She is alive. And then again, the shit hits the fan. Stephen, of course, as we saw in the first episode, thinks he speaks to her every day. Then we cut back to Harrow's office, but this time it's not Mark, it's Stephen, uh, which sort of surprises Harrow. Basically, he's like, um, oh, I haven't seen you in some time, Stephen. Um, but Mark doesn't uh, believe this is real. Um, I also calls him Ned Flanders, <laughs> which is perfect. <laughs> uh, so he says that, or Harrow says basically that Stephen came to therapy as a result of his mother's passing, and that he was worried he wouldn't acknowledge Mark, a.k.a. He thought you were delusional acting this happy life and that you would never acknowledge the pain and darkness within you in Mark. Stephen, though, refuses to believe that she's dead. As Harrow says, he will get her on the phone. But Mark, or sorry, but Stephen continues to make up excuses as to why she won't answer the phone. You know, she's busy, she won't answer the phone if she has no number, blah, blah, blah. Then Harrow offers him the phone. Uh, and for a moment, it sounds like there's, there's going to be someone in her line, but then it cuts back to Stephen's perspective. And he finally accepts it as we hear the dial tone that his mother is dead. Very softly, he just says, you know, my mother is dead. Really sad. Again, that Stephen has to acknowledge the darkness of that world as well, because of course, Stephen was that kind of innocent, pure, happy person. And now the darkness and the line is beginning to blur between those two personas. You also get the memory from earlier then, which seemed innocuous with Stephen waiting on a curb for a car or something. But what we really see is that that is Mark outside uh, the family home on the day of her Shiva. Uh, Shiva, for the record. Uh, and we should mention, Moon Knight is a Jewish character. And they really acknowledge that. He's wearing a yarmulke and everything. Um, I don't think believe, I don't know if they really reference it in past episodes, but it is a part of his identity. Uh, and here they make no bones out of it. It's a Shiva, which is, uh, the I think it's Yiddish for seven. Uh, it's the idea that you basically go into a week of mourning. So the, the commemoration, the funeral, as it were, um, is, is for his mother and he's standing outside tearful just drinking away and uh, we see outside his family home his father is kind of urging him to come in but he just 
he can't do it. Um, and it's really dark and really depressing. He's just drinking and sobbing and looking and he can't do it. And he starts to walk away, tearful, and kind of just collapses to his knees, almost like hyperventilating. And then we get a moment where he kind of flashes and turns back into Stephen, uh, who calls his mum and says that he's lost. Not even really acknowledging that he's in a different country, you know, because Stephen is always that kind of bumbling character where he's like, oh, this looks like, oh, they're driving on the other side of the road here. Ha ha ha, you know. Uh, not acknowledging that he's in New York and not London. <laughs> Mark says that this is the moment where their personalities started bleeding into each other. And Mark confronts Stephen and says that the things that she said weren't true and that it wasn't his fault. It was. It's a, this is a, a beautiful scene where... Basically, Stephen says to Mark what he's always wanted to hear, which is that the things your mother said were wrong. You were just a child. It wasn't your fault that your brother died. And they hug. Again, a fantastic moment that is a defining moment for this show and the MCU TV in general. That's what I think like that moment especially, like there won't boy there wasn't a dry eye in the house where it was like, man, especially because it comes so close to the end of the episode, you know, where we're where we just kind of got the emotional gut punts and we eventually we're on that journey of discovering all this with Stephen and then we finally get the moment where we can kind of acknowledge that Mark is a horrible person but he was he didn't start off as that you know he he's in the much of the way that he created Stephen Mark was created by trauma and uh, a mother that couldn't deal with loss uh, of, her, of her son really dark really fucked up but really interesting and it's it's strange because obviously you know the a lot of the shows can be kind of surface level this was just a gut punch and you know i, I would say that up till now moon Knight has been a show that hasn't always been what i wanted it to be i would say that it sort of settled into a groove there in the middle episodes that i was indifferent towards but i think you know this episode kind of kick-started the whole thing and it sort of made you know, it's it's that question of is it you know is it the destination or the journey? And getting to this destination, kind of made the journey worth it. Um, but could it have come earlier? Possibly. But I I think you know this this kind of reframes the whole show now. Um, it kind of would make you want to go back and and watch again. I would say. But yeah, certainly uh, an amazing episode. I should say that. We're we're not done yet though. Um, because back on the ship, they, they've arrived now at the gates of Osiris because uh, he is the god of the dead, resurrection, life, and the ruler of the underworld. The scales, though, still haven't balanced. I think we all kind of saw this sort of coming. Uh, basically, they're like, hey, if the, if the scales aren't balanced, you're going to be you know be cast into the sands of the duet and they'll claim you. Which I think we all expected, basically, that there could only be one of them going through. The scales are unbalanced because you multiple personas can't both go. And what I did like was the touch here, because it's so easy, it could have just been generic. And it's only a minor touch, to be fair. But it could very easily have just been random characters uh, coming on board. But it was a seemingly, from what I could tell, it was the characters that Mark had killed. Which, you know, makes it more powerful. It's like Mark is having to answer uh, for his sins directly. And he tries to fight them off, but he's totally overwhelmed. Uh, and he's about to be, over, uh, be thrown overboard into the sands. Stephen uh, mans the rudder though and does it like a, a severe turn which throws them off him. Stephen and Mark start to fight together. Again, it's that time where they're both starting to go a bit more like each other. They're starting to be uh, a more functioning uh, whole person, I suppose. So in doing that, they start to fight. Stephen fights off the dead as well. He does a pretty damn good job as well. And we got a, a kind of powerful moment where Stephen tells Mark that he can do this uh, because he realises that if you, know, if you can do it as Mark, I am Mark. I can do this too. And they start to fight. Uh, they kind of start swinging and Mark is grabbed once more. And as Stephen runs to fight them off, he falls overboard into the sands of the afterlife and is no more. You start to see him freezing and cracking. And Mark is left on the ship alone. And because of that, the scales balance and he can get in to the afterlife. The field of reeds and that's where episode ends <laughs> holy crap um wow uh again the supernatural elements here were interesting they're probably not 
you know, I, I, it, it served a good frame as a fr good framing device for the, the larger memory. Uh, I, I don't know how you would do this in a more conventional way, but I thought it was expertly handled. I do think we kind of expected uh, it to just be one person getting in anyway. The question though is, is when, when do we see Steven? Can he just create Steven again? If you're assuming he's resurrected? Who knows? Uh, I should mention as well that there's something um, in episode one that kind of hints at this when Steven is, uh, first shows up at work. There's a little girl who's basically saying like, what was it like being rejected by the field of reeds? And he goes, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not dead. Mm, yeah, you are now. <laughs> that girl is fucking psychic. Oh, I mean, God, I hope, uh, like, it's kind of a shame that, like, we had this nice, happy character in Steven and now he's just gone. Uh, we have our finale, of course, coming up. The finale is the shortest finale in MCU history, as far as these TV shows go, from memory. It's like 40, 47 minutes, maybe. And I find it very interesting. The question is, what are we going to get in the finale? Of course, everyone, with all the teasing and hinting, is expecting that we're going to get Jake Lockley. If we are going to get Jake Lockley, are we going to get a costumed... Uh, Alter ego. You know, I mentioned the possibility of Shadow Knight. I don't know is is that feasible. We could the, the possibility is we could also just get another costume of, of Moon Knight that's slightly more violent, because Jake Lockley generally is a more violent persona than the other two. It's it's kind of a shame. I, there's no way I think, based on how strong this episode was, and how I guess mature, that the finale kinda can't be a letdown <laughs> um, because I'm assuming it is going to be he gets back and it's a big punch up uh, in a super suit between him and Harrow as lasers go off which yeah like the, 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 there's certainly like Marvel are often called formulaic uh, unfairly at times but I do think the last episode of the shows often are uh, and it's kind of a shame with this um, I kind of actually went I think I went after the show the last time we talked about this where Everyone was saying, oh, it's going to be darker, brutal, nothing like it, more mature. Ugh. And really, if it wasn't for this episode, I don't know if you could back that claim. This is probably the episode that kind of goes some way to, to, to making all those true. So I do wonder what the finale is going to be like, Who, what's going to happen. The other interesting thing, uh, you know, as I said, basically the question is, is Jake Lockley going to show up? The more interesting question, though, is like a lot of the, the finales of the MCU have been in some way disappointing, I would say, because they don't necessarily provide closure because, of course, this is part of a long, ongoing narrative within the MCU. Uh, of course, all the other characters, though, have been characters already established in the MCU uh, who are going to presumably return at some point. This is a new character who, you know, isn't really connected to the larger MCU yet. Certainly, there's no the, the lack of MCU references in this is high, far harder than the other one. But the other question mark is, you know, we talked a lot, about, a lot about how Oscar Isaac has seemingly only signed up for this and nothing beyond it. So we don't know where the finale is going. That's kind of the big question mark going into this. Is it going to tie into larger MCU? Is there a chance that it could sit up for more Moon Knight somewhere? I mean, I assume it will. They certainly would like to leave the door open in case Oscar Isaac does decide to come back. But it's kind of weird. It's hard to picture just like... You know, Moon Knight just being like, oh yeah, I'll fight alongside the Avengers. It just doesn't seem like a perfect fit now. But, you know, maybe I could set up something like Midnight Suns. It'd be cool if we got a Blade appearance next week, wouldn't it? I, I'm not holding my breath for that. Either way, that has been Episode 5, Asylum of Moon Knight. And, well, next week. Maybe the end of the week. I don't know, because I'm late getting these videos out. Sorry, I'm really busy with something else we're working on, which we'll talk about in a sec. But that has been uh, The Rewatcher. Uh, I hope you come back next week for the finale. I'm sure we'll have a lot to discuss there. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you want to make sure you don't miss more, be sure to press subscribe. Of course, as mentioned, we're going to have a new series starting probably just after when Moon Knight videos end, maybe the week after the finale. Uh, we'll have Rewatcher in the Multiverse of Badness, where we're talking about some bad Marvel films from outside the MCU or the pre-MCU. But either way, Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you'll come back for more and come back next week for the net finale. Either way, I've been your cult leader, Tampa. Please come back next time because remember, I'll be watching. Take care. <laughs>